Paul's conversion to Christianity on the Damascus Road meant a complete reorientation of his life and redirection of his career. Having been confronted and commissioned by the living Christ, the apostle went forth into the world of his day no longer as a persecutor of the church, but as a dedicated proclaimer of the Christian gospel. He became the foremost missionary of the New Testament era. Significantly, the same Paul who delighted to discourse on the grace of God and the salvation divinely prepared for and offered to a fallen humanity, also provided Christians with earnest instruction concerning the necessity of their standing in a holy dread of the Almighty and employing the fear of God as a motivation for sanctified living. Welcome, everyone. This is A Word Fitly Spoken. I'm Willie Grills here with Zelwyn Heidi. Joining us again, the Reverend Adam Kuntz, to talk about the Apostle Paul and some of his writings. Gentlemen, how are you? Doing very well. How are you? Doing well. How is the weather in Fort Wayne? Uh, today, it's beautiful. The clouds have departed for the first time in a while. And, you know, we're enjoying life again because we're experiencing vitamin D in a natural form. So it's, it's, very, it's very nice. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Zolman, how's the whaling industry? <laughs> whaling industry. Well, up here in the, the far reaches of the north, it's cold, you know, not surprisingly. And uh, it snowed again last night. So I'm not sure I'm going to get vitamin D for a while. But that's just the way it goes. Well, that's okay. You can go to the trading Coming post. To you direct from yeah, you can go to the trading post and get your vitamin D supplements. <laughs> I, I don't know what beaver pelts to vitamin D supplements are these days, but you should be pretty good. <laughs> I hear the gentlemen from the Hudson Bay Company are very understanding <laughs> with the natives. <laughs> All right. Well, and Illinois continues to be mild as Illinois is and everything except for politics. So... <laughs> So we've, we've come today to do this episode on Paul, particularly Romans and Philippians, and we're kind of doing this episode now for a special reason. We want to dedicate it to the memory of the Reverend Dr. Walter A. Meyer Jr., or Dr. Walter Meyer II, as he's better known. And so here we are to talk about Paul and Paul's epistles, one of his most favored subjects. Gentlemen, any comments on Dr. Meyer as before we get into the uh, subject for the day? Yeah, Dr. Meyer had 70 years of ordained service in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. He was a vice president of Synod. He was pastor in three different churches, New York, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And he served for 48 years at Concordia Theological Seminary, first in Springfield, Illinois, in better times politically, I suppose, and then in Fort Wayne, Indiana, when the seminary moved in 1976. So we want to dedicate this episode to his legacy of expounding Paul, especially on whom he wrote his doctoral dissertation. We were all in that last generation of students that would have had him in the classroom a little bit. He was on Greek readings, I think was the last thing he was doing when we were all at That's campus. Right. So That's right. I feel kind of privileged you know, to be able to sit underneath him, even if it was in somewhat of a limited capacity there. But his legacy lives on in the teaching of his son and in the books that he wrote and the various essays and papers, which maybe we'll link to in future episodes and articles. Well, gentlemen, let's get to it then. We talked in a previous episode about the book of Hebrews and did a little bit of Paul posting there as well, but this is going to be an undisputed Pauline episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We might want to start then with this book of Romans here. Now, Romans is arguably one of the most famous books in all of the Bible, certainly among the most famous epistles, and a very commonly cited one in Protestant circles, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and I mean, really anywhere in Western Christianity, because the debates that we've had in church history, whether they were about grace or free will, predestination— and then in Reformation times, certainly about justification by faith, those debates are all being sourced out of how you read Paul. Well, I think, and I think um, what's going to surprise a lot of our listeners is, is that Romans is more than chapters 3, 5, and 8. 
And <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I think the one that people really love these days is Seven. Uh, maybe a misreading of Seven, but, but yeah, <laughs> well, yeah that's true that too. There's all there's a whole <laughs> blogging industry built up around that. But yeah, that's right. He, you know, it's not as important, and it, Paul's legacy is not as big in Eastern Christianity. Certainly, certainly, I understand to their deficit that they have not had these debates to the intensity that, say, Augustine did or later on Luther did in Reformation times. So Paul is massively important, not only biblically and historically, but also in terms of church history. If you don't know Romans, you sort of don't know what anyone's talking about in the West. What will be a good summary of the book of Romans? I mean, we're going to do a longer summary here, but if there's one central theme, what would it be? It's Paul explaining to people he doesn't know, he doesn't yet know, in the way that he knows other congregations, what his gospel is. What is the message that Paul proclaims and desires to proclaim using Rome as a base in the future, potentially, even to the western edges of the empire in Spain? What is Paul's gospel? And you can say that concisely as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, which comes by faith alone. So Paul's going to use this tagline from the prophet Habakkuk, that the righteous one shall live by faith, as a way of explaining what it is that he's proclaiming throughout the world, both to Jew and Gentile. Very good. Well, shall we start going through the chapters and talking about them? Yeah, I mean, I I think that the reason it's important for people to dig into Romans whether they've done it before, they're going to do it after they listen to this, is because the term gospel is thrown around so widely within almost any variety of Christianity. And if we're not really clear about that, then we will have a lot of the confusion that can result from misuse of scriptural words in non-scriptural ways. Because it's so prominent in the Bible, it's a word that anyone who's claiming to be Christian wants to use. The precise nature of that gospel is really important, which is why Paul, in writing to people he doesn't know, defines it beforehand. There's an insight there, I think, too, about how Romans functions as a cover letter for Paul's mission, right? So I send this ahead. I'm going to introduce you to more but I send you this letter to start with so that you can know what I'm about beforehand. So Paul understands his doctrine of the gospel, his teaching, his preaching as the primary thing about his mission. So how he defines that gospel is of the utmost importance. And that's that's why Romans has had such importance in church history. Very good. Well, all right, guys, let's start with chapter one. Don't know why I dramatically paused there, but <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to build up into it, right? That's right. They people come to word fitly spoken for the suspense <laughs> <laughs> and the and the random comments too. Right. So <laughs> you may be surprised to learn, listeners, that we're going to talk about paranormal activity in chapter one um, <laughs> um, because it's all over the Cattle place. mutilation by chapter 10. <laughs> right. It's happening. I, you know, I mean, chap- chapter one is controversial at this point because it's kind of the, it's the, it's the locus of dispute about what homosexuality is and how the Bible defines it. It's almost helpful to go when you go through Romans to think, what are people saying about this? That is contrary to what the scripture plainly says. So where Paul describes the practice of homosexuality as connected with growing idolatry and horrible punishments meted out to sinful human beings. You know, it's interesting that in the present day, what's being debated when certainly scholars talk about Romans 1 is whether or not Paul means, you know, just an abusive relationship or is this people who is this can this really mean two people who really love each other? You know, I think I think what I mean, I think what's interesting about that is that the reason to pay attention to academic debates is because eventually they get into the church. And so if you go back and you look at scholarship on Romans, you can find people arguing as early as the 1970s that the men who lie with other men in Romans one are really people who are just being like abusive to social inferiors. And it really doesn't have to do with homosexuality per se. So by the 1990s and the early 2000s, that argument is now inside the church. It's inside the pulpit. It's inside the Bible class. And now normal people end up believing well, it. Well, we're seeing it even in 
I've seen it in at least one notable confessional Lutheran argument, which says this is really not so much about the gay, but it's about men not doing their duty. That's what the word's really about. Even though it's explicit, what? What? even though it's as explicit Greek as you could get regarding right. this. But you know, right. anything to fit the niche of whatever either is either what's becoming a cultural norm or you got to sell books, right? So you have to have some kind of spin on uh, you know, the plain meaning of scripture. And so uh, it gets into a book, people believe it, people think they have big brains and and that they must be smart. And so clearly uh, this is this is what the right exegesis is and they just kind of go off with it as midwits do. And so <laughs> It's so e- a text like Romans, especially when it comes to these these introductory verses, are so clear. Uh, one would even say right. vivid <laughs> in in some of the word choices, and yet people can look at it and go, "Yeah, not really what he meant." You, you, right. I have more respect for the person who says, "Oh, this is what Paul meant. That's clear, but I don't agree with him." That's a much, that's a much more respectable position. Yeah, exactly. No, I. I- Totally, totally agree. Because I think I think what is remarkably ironic is that pe- when people think about the Reformation, you know, and they think about Luther, Luther's reading Romans specifically, chapter one, verses 16 and 17 are for him a big breakthrough in how he thinks about what it means that God gives righteousness rather than requiring it of human beings that in Christ Jesus, he gives his righteousness, which is his alone to give, and he gives it by faith alone. This is like the massive breakthrough. People don't understand that at the time, this is massively controversial within the church. And even though Luther has an appointed position of respect within the church, this gets him in all kinds of trouble. And people end up recapitulating in the modern day, the very exegetical moves that Luther's opponents made. So they'll do things like the portrait of God's God's wrath on human sin that Paul's going to draw from 1 verse 18 to about the middle of chapter 3 is going to be lessened by modern people for their own political reasons, ideological reasons, sexual predilections in the same way that medieval people lessened the wrath of God upon human sin in order somehow to preserve the medieval system of penance. It's always the same reality of human beings trying to hold on to something that cannot be destroyed by divine wrath and therefore altering the gospel. It's just ironic that those same moves are made by people who really would be completely disgusted by the medieval Roman Catholic Church. They they love to do the very same things with the Bible. And that's basically what chapter two in Romans, you guys are doing all the same things anyway. Well, right. Yeah, right. Well, because, because the, the other dynamic that's going on in Romans is that there's, there's a view that you could hold, especially if you're a Jewish Christian, that somehow your understanding of what the Gentiles do, because that's like open is therefore like you're kind of fine because what you do is done secretly. Right. And so Paul's also playing on this dynamic that you see it in something like the Sermon on the Mount that's going to be fairly well known to people that hypocrisy is kind of the 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 way that sin is expressed among the religious whereas flagrancy is the way that sin is most often expressed among the irreligious or the openly idolatrous but among the secretly idolatrous hypocrisy rules the day significantly Paul doesn't say I'm a hypocrite too Right. Okay, that's that's important to say, right. too, is that the picture of divine wrath on sin is not for Paul a portrait of the Christian life now. That comes later on in the letter. So Paul is not saying, yeah, and I'm a hypocrite, too. And I, I think a lot of the ways that we talk about sin, whether it's homosexuality and we say something that is very much unbiblical, like, well, it's just like any other sin. That's actually the opposite of what Paul's saying. Paul's saying that homosexuality is an intensification a, a, an unusually idolatrous form of human sin on sort of a gradient of sin. We, we say a lot of things that I think we, we think they sound like Paul, but if you don't pay attention to the flow of the argument, it's actually anti-Pauline to say that all sins are the same or to say that Christians are also hypocrites or a lot of kind of popularized memes of Paul. Right. Yeah, it's and it's just again, and as you've you've said more eloquently than I, it's just a way to soften the text and to make it unclear. And it, and it really just comes down to branding, signaling, and buzzwords in our day and age. 
it, it's just sort of a a degraded version of what we saw in the disputations of the past. Except now, you know, it's <laughs> yeah. just but now it's it's yeah. it's like pulp cultured and memed. And so it looks it looks a little different that way. And yeah, and all, all one has to do with sanctified reason, you know, anyone who's regenerate ought to be able to at least see clearly what Paul is saying in a lot of this, but we have to for the sake of whatever signal, whatever brand, whatever special interest, we have to change the meaning of the word and make Paul into something that he's not, rather than letting Paul's right. word stand. And really though, too, with what what we're doing more than that is we're twisting Paul's words to be sure, but these are the inspired words of the Holy Spirit, and ultimately it's his words that we twist and turn into lies at the end of the day. And the stakes are huge because what happens is that as the law is lessened in its sternness and clarity, then too the the flow of Paul's argument after the middle of chapter three, then he begins to speak about the gospel very clearly and mm-hmm. who are the true sons of Abraham, the nature of sin in Adam and the nature of salvation in the in the new Adam Christ. If you dilute the law, you dilute the meaning of the gospel. The gospel itself comes to seem not only grayer and weaker, but then I think finally unnecessary. And that's what we run into uh, with with certain people who would want to soften these introductory chapters. It's the idea that the law is merely some rhetorical thing. Yes, right, right. Yeah, that's right. all it is. And it might make you feel bad, but it's only there kind of – it's it's like the T that you set a, a baseball on. Uh, you know, and it, I don't know. Is that analogy going to work? It's just a setup. I, yeah. I don't know. Let's, let's, yeah, let's go for it. I, I don't, tell me, I just want to make it up as I go along. <laughs> but it is. It's just this rhetorical thing. It's just kind of a setup to get to something later, as if there's no real yeah. consequence, and it's not meant to really be this stern, because it's all going to be undone anyway later on. Well, I think what is, what's interesting, though, is that I think some people in their desire to uphold the severity of the law and say, like, you know, oh, Paul is saying... I'm a hypocrite too. I'm a sinner too. So we're all sinners. Yeah. They're actually yeah. kind of tearing it down inadvertently. Yeah. It's never presented as we're all sinners. Heaven help us. We need God's forgiveness in, in, a, in a way that's meaningful. It, it's, it's, yeah. it, it's presented as we're all sinners. So, so what? God's forgiven us. <laughs> and that's a subtle difference, but an important one. I th- I think it also it also fair it, it fails to capture the nature of the law as Paul talks about it and it's kind of a truism and if you're a little confused about Romans and you're listening you know Paul doesn't use the word law in exactly the same sense in every place because sometimes he's referring to the books of Moses sometimes he's referring to all of God's ethical demands but what's what's going on fundamentally is that Paul distinguishes between the law and sin the law is not itself sin. Sin is the problem. That's why death is the cure. You know, baptism is what it is in Romans 6, because death is the cure for the condition that sinful man headed up by Adam is suffering from. The law is not finally Adam's problem. It does function to reveal sin in the same way that it functions to reveal the severity of divine wrath in Paul's letter. But the law is not the problem. Right. Sin is the problem. Law law, law is merely diagnosing and indeed condemning. But at the same time, we say the law condemns as if God doesn't also condemn, as if if it's law apart from a judge. we, We drive that wedge as if the law is its own thing that sort of exists out there. The law becomes a boogeyman. But the law condemns simply because we condemn ourselves in sin. And ultimately, we'll be judged by the great judge. At least we say that in the creed, but who who believes that anymore? Well, I, th- I think you make a, a great point with that, though, Willie, because how often do we, within our current context, view the law as being something that's kind of separate and distinct from those who execute the law? So we don't have a lawgiver in any real sense. We have the executive office. We have, you know, this body right. over here that now someone else has to put into effect. And I think that's kind of affected right. the way we think about this. That's good. Mm-hmm. That's good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it also, if you, you know, setting, 
going into the next segment, you know, you have to remember that the same God who is condemning sin early in Romans will also, through his apostle, give instructions to his Christians about how to live their lives. And if the law is in and of itself evil, none of that actually makes sense. It, it makes sense if you understand them as those freed from the condemnation of the law. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And now free, they also delight in obeying their father's will. No, no, no. Paul simply gives them instructions on things to do so that they won't do them, and then he can, then he can let the gospel predominate. <laughs> isn't that isn't that why God, nobody ever means any instructions they ever give? When you tell your children to do something or to not do something, you don't actually mean it. You only want them to feel bad so that you can then tell them that you love them, and it doesn't really matter that they set the curtains on fire or whatever, you know, or. Whatever. All right, we're coming up on the first break. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly Spoken. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all them that trust in Him. The book that sits on your shelf, The One Gathering Dust, Word Fitly Spoken, asks you to once again take up and read. Hear the words of the only wise God and be saved. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. Willie Grills, Zoe and Heidi, and Adam Kuntz talking about the Apostle Paul's epistle to the Romans. So after that fun introduction, uh, we're going to move on to some other themes within Paul's writings and within Romans, excuse me. Paul is known as the Apostle to the Gentiles, but as we read through his works, that's not entirely, you know, we might get the wrong impression with that. Uh, he's still very much dealing with the Jews and their evangelism, and their salvation, how does that factor into Romans? It is really the middle of the letter, chapters 9 through 11, are devoted to the question of how Jews and Gentiles are related to one another in the divine plan of salvation. This is most often handled by dispensationalists, people that believe that God has worked really in categorically different ways throughout the history of salvation and has a different plan for people who are ethnically Jewish than for people who are non-Jewish, which is what the term Gentile includes. That is patently not what Paul says, but he does handle these ethnic distinctions with reality in Romans 9 through 11, but asserts that the, the term Israel, as he does also in Galatians, belongs really to those who believe in the Lord's promises, the righteous ones living by faith in the Lord's word throughout time and space. So he does not see Israel as a term that belongs to people who are ethnically Jewish, but to people who are believing in the Lord's promises, whatever their ethnicity. This, however, doesn't change the fact that Paul, as someone who is himself ethnically Jewish, desires the salvation of his own people. So there's, there's kind of a lot to unpack there, both, I think, in terms of present-day Jewish evangelism and also in how one should think about what are, you know, what's, what's the natural target area for evangelism, you know. We talked a little bit about this in the Hebrews episode, how Jewish inclusion in the New Covenant— it has been so distorted in this dispensational age, or excuse right. me, an age where dispensationalism is so common in world Christianity that it even affects the geopolitical situation. Right. And it's kind of amazing that that's happened. I don't think Paul has envisioned anything like that. And we come to the idea that the Jews perhaps should be evangelized 
are given priority in evangelism among other groups, among people in our own neighborhoods or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or another error, which people pull out of partially out of Romans 11, is an idea that the Jews do not need to be evangelized. Right. And so we want to reject both of those ideas. I mean, the person... In, in the simplest terms, the person who needs evangelize, if we can, if we're even allowed to use that term in in the Lutheran Church in 2019, <laughs> is the per, is is our own communities and whoever right. that makes it up. I mean, yeah, I mean, I suppose our one listener out there living in a Hasidic community that might actually be his mission field, so to speak. But your average guy in the Midwest or up in the Dakotas somewhere, or or really any place outside of New York and Florida. And and Hollywood, it, it, how many Jews do you see? <laughs> well, on occasion, <laughs> right? You know, that, and that's kind of the question being asked here too. Is you know, Paul is writing about the Jews because of his particular context, his particular ethnicity, right? But also in light of Old Testament passages regarding their salvation too. But but when you look at Acts. And, and you see how the, the church continues to go out, and you look at church history and the church and missions, it's it's pretty much we're preaching to the people that God has brought us to. Right, or, wherever that might be. and Wherever I, that I, might I, be, yeah, among whatever humans that might be. Right, and what is, I think, so commendable about Paul is that despite both the difficulties in his ministry with people who were trying to enforce a version of Jewish eth- ethnicity on all Christians, whatever their you know, ethnicity, that somehow Christianity would be fundamentally Jewish. He rejected that, and those people troubled him throughout his ministry. Sometimes he calls them Judaizers. Sometimes he calls those, he calls them of the circumcision. Sometimes he calls them those who mutilate the flesh. But his very own people, even within the church, were in many ways distorting the gospel. On the other hand, what you can see, especially in Acts, is his lack of success with his own ethnic group, generally speaking, because they understand the gospel as a kind of threat to their sense of being chosen. And that is also why the term that we think of as it, in Romans, it's the election of grace. In Ephesians 1, it's predestination. Why this notion of whom has God chosen and the biblical answer being God has chosen a people for himself from before the foundation of the world whom he shall certainly save without respect to ethnicity. That is understood both in Paul's time and today by many Jews as a threat to their ethnicity as if not to be chosen on the basis of ethnicity is somehow an insult. But that's why you keep getting discussions of what does it mean to belong to Abraham? What does it mean to be Israel throughout Paul's letters? Because those are the very things that Judaizers are arguing with him about. Well, we use the term Judaizer in a very broad sense today, almost like Pharisee, to where the point that it has right. no meaning. Right. But the church was actually pretty good about evangelizing any ethnicity for most of its history. And it's only in modern times with the rise of Messianic Judaism with the rise of Christian Zionism, C.I. Schofield's Bible, that we start to see these attitudes that Paul is arguing against come Mm -hmm. back in any meaningful way or on any kind of large scale. And we're we're living with it. Messianic Jewish communities continue to rise. And why might might Romans particularly apply to them? Or why might it speak to their error? I guess we'd say. Because often in Messianic Judaism, you get an idea that Jews— per se, as an ethnic group, are specially loved by God, even when that variant, and there are many, of Messianic Judaism may claim that it is essential for ethnic Jews to trust in Christ's righteousness for salvation. So even in places where you get a sort of fairly good articulation of what Paul is saying in, say, Romans 3 and 4, there remains confusion about what he's saying in Romans 9 through 11. And Paul's actual position, whereby he says, Israel all along has been constituted not by blood, but by faith all along, that, that that is actually abused in the modern day as, quote, supersessionism, as if somehow the church has replaced ethnic Israel, whereas Paul actually says, no, Israel has always been constituted by faith, not by works of the law. 
Right, and, and see, and that's a very good point. With the Messianic Jews, they still believe in Christ, but they're adding these extra, these extra ethnic qualifiers onto things. Not necessarily with regard to salvation, but with regard to preference and perhaps salvation for other groups. It stands in contrast to the ultra-dispensationalists, like a John Hagee or somebody like that, where these guys all but say that the Jews are saved by virtue of being good Jews. And, and, and what they mean by that is keeping the law. Right. And I, I think that that is, at least since the Second Vatican Council, also the position of the Roman Catholic Church. Right. And they, and they extend that to basically any religion as well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. They extend it to Islam. I, I don't know. Could you, be a, could you be a virtuous devil worshiper as long as, you know, loyal to your code and be saved in post-Vatican II Catholicism? I don't know. All I know is that they did have idols in their churches up until a week ago. <laughs> Uh, until some fine Austrian gentleman took care of the problem. I think the only way to go to hell, according to Pope Francis, would be to be a believing traditionalist Roman Catholic with 11 kids. Um, That would be be pretty much the only way to go to hell, according to the current, the current Pope. Um, (laughs) We we do, although we confess the papacy to be the true end times antichrist, we do miss Benedict on this podcast. That is the That's right. F for, F for Benedict. <laughs> he's, just, he's just tucked away in a corner somewhere gathering dust. Can someone right. check on him? Now, right. now, hold on a second. Not only are we bringing in, you know, Jewish notions of, you know, superiority of the Jewish race, but now we're also bringing in the hidden Messiah and he's called Benedict 16. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, it wouldn't go quite that far this episode, but... <laughs> We will discuss the Lavender Mafia at another time. (laughs) That's right. Google it. Uh, (laughs) Also, the Black Pope, while you're at it. It's always kind of funny when a chick tract is only one step removed from being right. (laughs) (laughs) That's a sentiment that's often occurred to me as well. So Now, what is the image, then, of true Israel that Paul gives? He gives kind of a symbol. Well, he's got he's got an olive tree. There we go. And he speaks of grafting, in, in which case Paul understands that w- that what uh, the way that he's trying to portray not not the constitution of Israel, which is by faith, but sort of the 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 real ethnic dynamic that is also narrated in Acts, whereby if you follow the progression of Acts, you get Jews and God fearers followed by Gentiles on their own coming to faith. Paul's trying to portray salvation history as a process of God's grafting of ethnicities onto an original root, an original trunk, which has been flourishing through his planting. Yeah, there you go. Zelwyn, you're being awful quiet over there. <laughs> no, I'm just enjoying enjoying the show. It's a it's a good time this time around. Zelwyn, Zelwyn is offended that we deny um the various dispensations of grace uh, throughout <laughs> biblical history or upholding the pope, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not the pope or the papacy, just just the one that was like sympathetic <laughs> to us, you know. Zelwyn's getting a little, Zelwyn's getting a little hot under the bepchen right now. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> <laughs> Zalwin understands the doctrine of the Antichrist to include, you know, believing that each pope literally has hooves. So that's, you know, that's, right. that's where we differ. Yeah. Yeah. Might as well be sulfur in that incense sensor. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. You, you, do what, you do what you have to. Well, so I think we've settled. We've, we've answered the Jew question, the Jewish question, at least in part here. So let's move on a little bit then. Let's talk about the fear of God a little bit more. Adam, since that's your wheelhouse, uh, do you have some more we could say on that? Yeah, and that that is what Dr. Meyer II wrote his doctoral dissertation on, was the fear of God in Paul's theology. It's a helpful way of summarizing how Paul is speaking about Christian life, especially to people who are living in the belly of the beast in Babylon, in Rome, the center of the empire, how he speaks from chapters 12, really through 15 in Romans, giving them instructions about how to relate to the government, how to deal with offenses, how to live quiet lives in the midst of an unquiet and idolatrous society. It's helpful to think about the fear of God in this way, because when we speak about the fear of God and the confessions, which are really rich in ways to read Romans and ways to employ Romans, 
the Lutheran confessions speak of the fear of God, bro- both in what they in the tradition will term servile fear, the fear that a servant has of a master, but also in terms of a filial fear, the fear that a son has, the reverence, the love that a son has for a father. So as Christians are living under grace, not under a law, they are presenting themselves for the use of righteousness. They are presenting themselves to the Lord, their bodies as living sacrifices to the Lord so that he can employ them for his purposes. And the whole image here is of a people constituted not by ethnicity, but by faith, now presenting themselves not for the political use of this or that ethnic you know, monarch like Herod or the, the Herods in Palestine, nor even for Caesar's purposes, but for God's purposes. And what's interesting here is that you know, we, we said Paul does not present himself or the other Christians as hypocrites, but he does present them as people who are engaged in something that is, as it were, hidden from the world's view. I I think a lot about this when I think about the church's relationship to the United States. And, you know, I, I, there was, there are various ways of articulating this very popular. A lot of times in Lutheran circles is the, the non-Lutheran, the theological descendant of the Prussian union, Reinhold Niebuhr, Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr and Reformation Day both come from the Prussian union. I just want everyone to know that (laughs) audience (laughs) now triggered. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) You know, it's whatever. It is what it is. Um, but Reinhold Niebuhr articulated different, you know, relationships that different theological traditions have to the United States. I don't think that those are nearly as helpful as what Paul says, whereby Paul does not say that I'm somehow trying to get influence in the American government, because we see how that has turned out, for instance, for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. And, and and how that gets constituted and just reified as you are you get to be the religious wing of whatever political party will listen to you and let you have an audience. Paul is not really concerned about will Caesar one day do what I think he should do. Paul is concerned about fearing God in the midst of a society that, you know, serves God in certain ways when it does punish wickedness, but is generally doomed to destruction with a world that does not trust in Christ. And this is where justification by faith really affects Paul's articulation of politics. Because it, be, if the righteous is justified by faith in Christ alone, then a seeking of justification through a, an, a greater extension of political influence it simply is not in the cards, which is why, for instance, in Romans 13, Paul does not present us with a plan to take over Roman imperial government. Well, and in that discussion of Romans 13 as well, you also see the very interesting dynamic of that fear of God playing out in, you know, obey the government, not because it is the government, but because you're ultimately obeying the your real master, the Lord. Right. You know, this idea that you know, because I think sometimes when we talk about like two kingdom theology within Lutheran circles, you can sometimes come away with the impression that we just kind of have to do whatever the government tells us because God somehow right, put right. it over us. But that's not really right. Paul's point. Paul is really just saying we are to, you know, obey as far as possible, but because we are ultimately obeying our true Lord and master in heaven, the one who has, you know, who can cast both body and soul into hell. Yeah, you get you get this articulation by the apostles in Acts five when they say that they they despite the prohibition of the Sanhedrin, they must speak in the name of Jesus. Right. They they have to, because they must obey God rather than men. There are times when the government is actually serving God's purposes. There are times when it is not, but that should not lead to an inconsistency in the Israel of God in in the church, because the church should at all times be exercising itself in the fear of God. Right. Well, and you also get that um, in First Peter 2, and being subject for the, for the Lord's sake to every human institution. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now, I know I'm bringing Peter into a Paul posting uh, <laughs> session, but still, I think the point is there, that we are called to fear, love, and trust in him, and to then do what he says, even when that means a very difficult difficulty within our present life, suffering. 
Yeah, and if you think back to Paul's use of Habakkuk, the pertinency here of Habakkuk and the notion of li- of not only trusting at one single point in your life in Christ, but actually living by faith, is that Christianity is so different from Islam in this way because Christianity believes that the Lord's salvation is near at hand, such that our purpose is to carry out our lives in quietness and holiness until such time as Christ shall appear again in great glory with his angels and gather his elect to himself. We are therefore not engaged in a scheme of political takeover. I mean, I this is something that very much bothers me when not only academics, but journalists and therefore normal people who, for some reason, still listen to them, use phrases <laughs> like religious violence. Whereas if you simply look at the New Testament, the doctrine that Paul teaches concerning the use of violence, which is the punishment of wickedness, is not given to the church. The church is not there to exercise a kind of holy violence upon the world. In contrast to the Quran, which is actually a little shorter than the New Testament, it's not doesn't take that long to read, but has a completely different understanding of the exercise of violence by what they understand to be God's people, because the Quran does not think that you are actually living solely by faith in Christ. So our doctrine of justification plays into also how we relate to the government, because right along the way, the whole time, the righteous are always living, trusting at all times by faith in Christ. Well, very good. Um, now that's still going to leave room open for crusades and other various holy wars, I'm assuming. <laughs> <laughs> Subject for another day. Subject to another time, yeah. Right, we'll get to crusades and theonomy soon on Word Fitly Spoken. But for now, <laughs> we've got to take our next break. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly. The word of the Lord says, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. You can check out all of the Word Fitly Spoken podcasts on Podbean, iTunes, or your favorite podcast app. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Word Fitly, everyone. Willie Grills, Zelwyn Heidi, Adam Coons, talking about the Apostle Paul. Well, guys, we had a fun jog through a few chapters of Romans there. And remember, if you do have any questions, come over to Word Fitly Posting and shoot us a message or to the Facebook page or email us, and we'll be happy to clarify anything or get some point you to some good resources on the subject. So we're going to move away from Romans right now and head over to Philippians. Which one of you distinguished gentlemen wants to give me an intro to Philippians? I want Zelwyn to do that because I think that Zelwyn is our representative of joy and certainly our encourager in everything. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I want to just mention that the reason that we're doing Philippians as the third segment, this was a particular favorite of Dr. Myers. It was also, I believe, by his request, the text for his funeral sermon was from Philippians 4. And he was described by many as an encourager, which is which is what I think precisely Paul is doing in Philippians as Paul himself contemplates his own death. Right. Yeah, because Paul is dealing with some very difficult uh, periods in his life, you know, being in prison and that sort of thing. And he's writing to the church in Philippi a very encouraging letter. In fact, I would argue maybe even the most encouraging letter out of all of the New oh, Testament yeah. epistles. Oh, yeah. I mean, 
I, does he say anything bad about Philippi? I'm not even sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are, there are definitely people in Philippi, the dogs, <laughs> those who mutilate the flesh, <laughs> those who make much of themselves, whose end is destruction. But those are those are clearly his opponents. He separates them from the congregation. So, yeah, the congregation right. is not riddled with insanity like the Corinthians. <laughs> so this might be the only New Testament congregation that would be like the ideal, but well, it is what it is. Yeah, no, I mean, when, certainly whenever I talk about it to students, I love to emphasize that, you know, I, I think that people overestimate, you know, the, 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 the prevalence of Corinthian congregations. I think it's, it's very, it's very popular for, I mean, I, I don't know how many pastors I've met who have described themselves as Jeremiah's, you know, the, their fate. And, and they say this with a sort of proud resignation, like, well, I just have to be a Jeremiah, you know, that, that, that they are consigned to these awful situations and, 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 and awful duties to call a, a stubborn people to repentance who, who will not hear. And that certainly can be the case. And I think it was very much the case for Paul with the Corinthians. But there are plenty of Philippi's out there. Not every congregation is the synagogue of Satan, as it were. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, no. Actually, no, no, no. This is a good point because it's our version of Roman dolorism. That's what's happened here. We glory in suffering, real or imagined, to the point that everything, it's as if you're wearing a hair shirt all the time. Everything becomes annoying to you. Everything then becomes persecution, and you can find no joy, and you just become convinced that everything is evil or wicked or, or out to get you. When oftentimes, it is simply just the result of living in a sinful world, perhaps one one's own inability to communicate with others. And sometimes, yeah, it, you are put into a bad situation. But not everything is evil and coming down upon you. Right. And, and, and misunderstandings between people, every instance of, you know, interpersonal adversity in a congregation does not a, quote, bad congregation or, quote, toxic congregation. Correct, make. correct. I, you know, yeah. Philippians is a place where you get, for instance, specific mention of two names of women who plainly don't agree with each other, Euodia and Syntyche. And he says, you know, admonish them to agree in the Lord. The fact that not everything is roses is simply life. But there's a there's there's this prevailing idea in certain circles that if things are going well, if the congregation is peaceful or contented, then you're probably compromising somewhere. <laughs> right, yeah. but, but the only yeah. but the only way you can be faithful is if you've angered everyone, or if everyone's mad at you, and that's not that's not the case because that's not what the Bible says. But isn't it interesting that Paul, talking about that very compromising in Philippians, says that mm -hmm. some preach the gospel out of envy, but I still rejoice in it because Christ is being proclaimed. Right, right. right. Could, we, could we say that in our situation today? True, and here Paul is in his life obviously has faced real persecution, right? Actual torture <laughs> and beatings, and, actual yeah. imprisonment at that time, right? And this is not a nice white collar resort prison either. <laughs> no, it's not. You know, it's not modern day. You know, Norway or something. <laughs> <laughs> he, is, he is imprisoned. And what's interesting is it's obvious that the Philippians are thinking, oh man, what are we going to do without Paul? How will we How will we ever get on? Because Paul will explain his imprisonment as, well, really, this has served to advance the gospel. So I, I think that Paul's, Paul's joy proceeds out of the understanding that the gospel you know, as he says, he says it this way in Second Timothy with regard to the same situation. I am in chains, but the word of God is not in chains, and and that's what he rejoices in. Mm -hmm. That whatever actually happens to him, if he remains alive, that will be for the comfort and not for the sorrow of the Philippians. But if he dies, he says that's gain. It's it's like to him, what is this world to me? Except Paul actually means it when he sings it. But you guys quote Philippians 4.13, you know, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, you know, when you're like lifting weights or something, right? <laughs> Are you saying the Christian bodybuilding groups of the early 90s and late 80s were not, were misapplying this verse, Ellen? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. I'm just going to say it plainly there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think only here on Word Philly Spoken. <laughs> the spiciest, so...
<laughs> we're going to get letters from the from the remaining American gladiators who converted and are now making a living doing this. In, in youth groups throughout the suburban south. Right. <laughs> right. We're going to get letters from guys named like Turbo and Max with two X's, but also from like Pastor Schmidt somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, i'm kind of left at a loss um here that's all right well i think i think what what's also so great about the book of philippians is dealing with this this tension between you know our present situation and the the difficulties that we might be facing as christians especially with paul being in prison and also the the joy that will actually come forth from that grief, knowing that God's control, God's providence over all of these things is actually so great that we we can rejoice even in the very worst of circumstances. And so that's why I think oh, Dr. Myers, you know, constantly referring to rejoicing in the Lord is such an, an apt thing for us as Christians because we are we are joyful. You know, we are called to rejoice. Because right. our Lord is in control. And does this differ significantly then from just saying, oh, suck it up, walk it off, be, don't worry, be happy? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it does substantially because a lot of times when, when people use that kind of very pop culture level stoicism, there's nothing else in mind other than simply enduring that moment. And that is not what Paul is saying, because Paul is has this really lively awareness that what seems like an eternity when you are in pain, when you're actually suffering, as he is imprisoned, that can vanish in a moment, and its significance and its seeming power over you can vanish in a moment, because Paul is looking, as he's looking at the advance of the gospel and the flourishing of love among the Philippians, for the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians has not only an accent on joy, it also has an accent on the second coming of our Lord. And it's because of that lively awareness that the Lord can return at any moment whenever he so chooses not according to some dispensationalist chart concocted, you know, in 1952 at Dallas Seminary or something, but according to his own plan and purposes, which are hidden from us, it's because of that that Paul can have this confidence because he knows that the judgment that the Lord has reserved to himself and the coming that the Lord has reserved to himself can at any moment, whether it is in Paul's death or in the second coming of Christ, change everything about the world. In, in, in the twinkling of an eye. And, and that is kind of a remarkable thing. It, and it's, it's a lot like, I think, what you said about the law in Romans, Willie, where we often reduce these things to rhetorical flourishes, the law and God's wrath as a rhetorical flourish before you do the second half of the sermon, which is happy, or the mention of a second coming as just kind of like something that we believe. But Paul is looking at these things as realities. And because they are realities, they really affect how he thinks about, you know, what does it mean to me that I will die? What does it mean to me that the Imperial Guard has control over me right now? It means very little, in fact, because I believe that Christ is in control of the heavens and the earth. That's that's very well put. Maybe kind of building off of some of that, um, though you're talking about stoicism, a stoic idea that kind of just suck it up, just kind of endure the moment kind of has this kind of static quality to it. Like you're just kind of there and I'm just kind of letting it happen to me, but I'm not going to be affected by it. Whereas Paul, and this is what I think one of the other beautiful things about the book of Philippians is talking about Christianity, you know, the, the hope that we have being like a race, you know, in that pursuit of Christ, Mm -hmm. knowing that uh, even if we do have to, go through a difficult thing, whether imprisonment or whether, you know, whatever it might be, we are still running that race set before us to gain the prize, the upward call of, of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. You know, this, this athleticism of Philippians, I think is a, is a big part of the joy that we have of, of, as Christians. Yeah. If you think about the image from Hebrews of Jesus running his race, like, like like a strong athlete, I mean, running his course with joy. 
the reason that occurs is because you are excited for what you're what you're looking forward to at the end, which is why, you know, a lot of times when people say don't exercise, they look at someone doing something athletic and it's almost unimaginable how that could ever occur. But the reason someone can go through the pain, the training, any kind of endurance that's called for is because is not because he loves you know the twinge or the pain or the you know grueling exercise whatever discipline is required it's because he loves the prize because he's striving for what comes at the end and for paul that's the resurrection it's a lie to say that you don't want to win in any sport that's number 1 it's an american but number 2 it's it's simply not true <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe for long distance runners, I don't know. But but the idea that you would compete and not want to win is, is simply silly. That's why the man really needs to want to win. That we need some kind of struggle in our life. And this goes back a little bit to the beginning of the segment where there's kind of this love of misery that infects pastors a lot and and, and others. But you want to overcome that because you do want to strive for the prize. But we we become rather defeatist. One, because we don't see our physical lives as very active. You know, hashtag I have the body of a heavy reader or something like that. <laughs> and, and we also don't see our spiritual lives as active. We do yeah. understand that salvation is passive, but the Christian life is not inactive. Because of that fact, are we not actively engaged in spiritual warfare? Is prayer itself not an active discipline in the Christian life? Do we not even discipline our bodies for the for the sake of this? Well, it's it's important that you bring up prayer in this connection here because you know so often I think we view prayer as being something like I just got to get through, like I just got to kind of endure it for the moment, like a stoic, and then I can get on to what I was really wanting to do. Whereas for Paul, this would be part of our race as a Christian to take up the weapon of prayer and to really, you know, engage and and pursue the prize, which is Jesus Christ. So, yeah, all of these things which we have as the weapons of our spiritual warfare should not be seen in this stoical kind of fashion, but in the joy and the the pursuit, the athleticism that Paul presents them as. Yeah, and you know, perhaps it's a case of asking the question of how we take up this mantle, how we do what Paul admonishes us to do. How does one pray in this way? How does one go about their Christian life this way? And I've often wondered in this day and age if some of the great tools that we have for, say, prayer, for example, have now become crutches for us. Apologies to Cramner because you know we, we like having the prayer offices and such set down, and those are good. But it does become this idea of well, I opened up the treasury, or I opened up this prayer book, and I went through this little right here, and and I'm good, and that's prayer. Boom, prayer's done. And there's a sense in which that's true, but there's a sense in which it becomes merely rote, and it merely becomes habit, and not the good kind of habit that you want to cultivate. We can get so accustomed to that same pattern of words that we do it without even thinking. And I know oftentimes we we want to say, well, that's good, because then you're concentrating not what's on the page, but what's on your saying. And that's not actually true. You're mindlessly going through it. And we run the danger of becoming the babblers that, excuse me, the babblers that the Bible warns us against. We think that by doing the bare minimum or by doing nothing or by doing whatever we find written in red or black, that now we've somehow fulfilled this, that this is our striving towards that goal, or at least putting a check mark in. Well, it's like, well, I did my crunches today, or it's your food pyramid. Well, I got enough grains and vegetables in, so I'm good. Time to go to the top part of the pyramid, which is I've done my prayer office. I did my Bible reading. Now it's time for 16 hours of YouTube and Netflix. (laughs) <laughs> and that's not what Paul's driving at here. And again, it's not to say that those <laughs> that, <Yes>. the, <laughs> that those that the resources we have are bad. That is not what I'm saying at all. And I would never go into the other error of saying it all has to be from your head, and uh, because otherwise it's not from your heart. That's not true at all. 
it's simply saying, let's not become lazy. Let's not allow these things to become lazy. Let's always be intentional in what we're doing. Yeah, you can be lazy with an ex corde prayer, one out of the heart, just as you can be lazy with reading a prayer. Absolutely, absolutely. And if our audience was predominantly Pentecostal, I'd probably be taking a, a, a different road when it came to this discussion, you know, or, or, or a Baptist or something like that. Implying that our audience isn't overwhelmingly Mormon, but That's, this um, is true. <laughs> we're not only the number one um, podcast in the Wisconsin Senate, but we're we're, <laughs> we're 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 near the top of the charts in Salt Lake City right now, too. We're right below Gospel Tangents at this point. That's right, um, as far as I know. So. <laughs> Rick Bennett. Best Mormon <laughs> podcaster out there by far. I I think one more thing about Philippians is the human warmth that you see throughout it in the way that Paul talks to the Philippians talking about they, you know, I know you were concerned about me. Now you're able to hear that I'm doing okay in the way that he talks about Timothy in the way that he talks about the little known and, and even less remembered Epaphroditus who was sick and he reassures them that he's okay and and Epaphroditus was worried that they were worried it's all very charming i mean honestly how how much the flourishing of the gospel and the love that comes from it creates this warmth between people and this connection which is both theological and personal and that's something that when we're talking about things like like when we talked about Bible reading, the importance of Bible reading in the paranormal episode, is that a lot of times we tend to separate learning theology from learning to be a different or a better kind of person. And what you can see in the New Testament is that both on an individual level with how Paul describes himself being changed, like he talks about, I used to value these things about my ancestry in Philippians. I I think that's the beginning of chapter three. But now I count those all as rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ and being found in him. So both on an individual level and a collective level, the gospel makes a new kind of man in Christ. Behold, if anyone is in Christ, he, there is a new creation. And that new creation expresses this kind of warmth, this love, this re- recollection of gifts and kindnesses from from one another. All of that is part of Philippians. So what you're seeing is not only an expression of the Christian hope and, and the second coming of Christ and the, and the resurrection, but also what kind of a person is made by this gospel of Christ returning in great glory. And and it's that kind of person that Paul says, what you have seen and heard and observed in me, Philippians, practice these things, live in these ways, which are so wholesome and so warm. Which is also an excellent point. And you just mentioned there in Philippians 4, that idea of, you know, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, if there's any excellence, all those sorts of things. Whatever is worthy of praise, think about these things. And that idea that, yeah, we think on these things not because, well, that's, again, that thing I just have to endure for a while before I can get on to the binge that I really want to do, but rather that this is changing us and making us into better. I mean, it's making yeah. us better. I don't, you don't, well, I, you shouldn't, right. you shouldn't even try to like gainsay that. It's just, it is objectively making us into better people. Because we're right. Because we're, we're not striving for a certain amount of information. We are striving for a life, which is presently ours in Christ. But as we look forward, not, only to a future which may include suffering for the gospel, but which ultimately is a future about resurrection, we are living an entirely new life. Christianity is a cosmic message about a life which is now available to mankind through faith in Christ Jesus. So this is nothing for which we need to apologize when we speak about a better life, because Paul, in speaking of any other kind of life, says it's rubbish. The only life I'm looking for is the life which is now mine in Christ, on which I have set my mind and my heart, and I'm pressing toward the prize. Or maybe just to to tie it all up into a nice little bow, as Paul does, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. The Lord is at hand. Amen. This has been a Word Fitly Spoken. If you like what you heard and want to know more, check us out wordfitlyspoken.org, facebook.com slash wordfitly, or Twitter at wordfitly. I'm Willie Grills, here with Zelwyn Heidi and Adam Kuntz. God love you, and God bless.
The name Walter Meyer is not unfamiliar to our listeners. The life of the first Dr. Meyer was profiled on the podcast, and Dr. Meyer III has been a guest. In between those two men stood another great man of God, with zeal for truth and fire in his bones, Walter Meyer II. Wham too, as he was affectionately known, was a fixture in the classrooms of Concordia Theological Seminary for decades. Especially edified were those privileged to hear him teach about Paul's epistles. Dr. Meyer was known for his kindness, patience, and graciousness to all. We thank the Lord for raising up such a man that men might know the gospel. He now joins his father, Wham One, in the church triumphant, where they ever behold the face of the Lord. His testimony continues in the faith handed down to his children and grandchildren, and in the word of God he preached in truth and power, which never returns void.